Celtic Badass of the Week showcases a different badass person of Celtic heritage each week. Those who exemplify the give no shit attitude and come on on top. They may come from our past or our present, but rest assured they come from all walks of life and legend. They are men, women, even old ladies and pirate queens. You don't have to be a muscled up Celt and a fur kilt swinging a mighty sword. You can just be a four foot eleven Welsh woman and suffragette who knows jujitsu. Most of these badasses are all too real. While some may be only legend, badass legends though. The only prerequisite for this title is Celtic blood and badassedness. Alright, this week's Celtic badass is Neil Armstrong. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, dude, he's an astronaut. How's he, a, how's he a badass? Dude, you have no idea. Now it's probably going to be hard for me to get through this one. I might get a little emotional. Uh, might have a tear drop, but don't worry. My tears are made out of acid, so it'll be fine. Just like any other badass, of course. Now he is quoted as saying that there can be no great accomplishment without great risk. It's true. And here's a fun fact about Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong was descending the lunar module towards the surface of the moon, hurtling 50,000 feet towards the rocky surface of an alien landscape at a little over 60 miles an hour. Now, the entire instrument panel, it failed on him. And by failed, I mean it just died. The, the electronics went totally insane, screaming alarms at the Apollo 11 mission commander and alarms and klaxons and warnings about how they were there was about too much tele, uh, telemetric data coming in for the state-of-the-art lunar module computer to process you know state-of-the-art for the time anyway now undeterred by the ominous beacons of his impending fiery mutilation Neil Armstrong did pretty much what nobody in their right minds would have done and that he turned the computer off <laughs> so here's here was Neil Armstrong, harnessed into a cramped little, thin aluminum coffin, packed with all the technology and computer of a TI-85 solar-powered calculator, 238,900 miles from home, or any chance of rescue, and he was fighting the controls, trying to manually place a two-passenger missile packed with jet fuel on the surface of an interstellar object nobody has ever attempted to land on before. That's badass, and he had to do it delicately enough as not to crash, fall over, explode, or otherwise bring about the brutal, violent deaths of everyone inside, and make it impossible to ever leave again. Now, the lunar module had just 20 seconds of fuel left in the tank, and had only one control, the active thruster, meaning Armstrong's job was to manually fly the lunar evacuation model, or LEM, and possibly landing it on the moon, hopefully landing it on the moon. Now it was an impossible task, only marginally possible for the greatest pilots. Now he'd had one shot, and his actions would either make or break world history and bring about his terrible premature death. Just attempting this makes him the biggest badass here or out of this world. Well, of course we all know how the story ends. The computer came up. But it came up while Armstrong and Aldrin landed the LEM manually. And the first man to set on the foot on the moon on any celestial object other than Earth was Neil Armstrong, just some hick from a small farm in middle America. He was born in Ohio in August of 1930, and growing up there in the Great Depression will teach a man about something and himself. And Neil Armstrong learned values like the importance of hard work, busting his ass for 40 cents an hour as a stock clerk in a pharmacy before and after school. When this guy wasn't acing math tests or playing baritone in a presumably awesome jazz band called the Mississippi Moonshiners, he became an Eagle Scout, helped work the farm, and got so freaking pumped about aircraft that he built a homemade wind tunnel out of stuff he found around town just so he could test out his custom made models that he designed himself. He made a couple uh, by combining multiple kits together in some badass Frankenstein aircraft factory he had. Now he earned his pilot's license on his 16th birthday and before this kid could even legally drive 
He was working a day job, test flying, 80, a 56, I'm sorry, 65 horsepower two-seater prop planes that had just been repaired. Now, taking these formerly busted little wooden planes out on joy rides to see if they could be piloted without falling apart and crashing back down to earth, he got the job by default because nobody else wanted it and ended up logging so many hours as a teenage test pilot that the Navy offered him a scholarship to study aeronautical engineering at Purdue, provided he commit to spending a couple years as a naval aviator when he was done. Now, Neil Armstrong did two years at Purdue. Then he transferred to Naval Air Station Pensacola, earning his wings at the age of 20, and shipped off to the Korean War, where he was the youngest kid in his squadron. He flew 78 combat missions in a Grumman F-9F Panther, an early model jet fighter, where he uh, earned three air medals, evaded capture, and was rescued after being shot down behind enemy lines and survived an uh, emergency crash landing on the deck of the USS Essex. When all was done, he decided to go back and finish his degree, marry a beauty queen, sorority girl, because what the hell, what else do you have going on? And while the military thing wasn't really doing it for him, flying was in Neil Armstrong's blood. Now after school he went to Edwards Air Force Base outside Los Angeles and spent the uh, next seven years working as a research test pilot which is basically the same thing he was doing when he was 16. Only instead of flying rickety wooden propeller planes, he was hurtling through the stratosphere at three times the speed of sound in a cockpit of an experimental test fighter that was packed with enough rocket fuel to vaporize sheet metal. Now as a research test pilot, this self-proclaimed white sock, pocket protector, nerdy engineer not only had the exciting, terrific job, I'm oh, sorry, terrifying job of testing out wildly unstable uh, jets capable of shredding the sound barrier like a cheese grater dismembering a tomato but then when he was done he got to write a report about what was so awesome about the plane and what needed to be fixed Neil Armstrong logged over 3,000 hours at the controls of over 200 aircraft ranging from canvas gliders that only used a dashboard compass for navigation to supersonic experimental jet fighters with gigantic rocket engines grafted onto the fuselage, piloting anything, anytime, anywhere, regardless of how likely it was to blow up in his face and kill him. When this dude wasn't ripping off hellaciously righteous loop-de-loops and Chuck Yeager's X-1 B streaking through the stratosphere at Mach 5.7 at an altitude of 207,000 feet in the cockpit of the X-15 hypersonic rocket-powered suborbital jet fighter, who, or testing out aircraft that ended up being the basis for fighters like the F-14 and the F-18, he was flying as the chase plane following some other nutcase in a human-propelled death missile and making notes about whether or not he thought that poor bastard in front of him was about to explode in a cloud of jet fuel and awesomeness, due to some minor technical oversight in the structural design of the machine that he might have been piloting. Man, I need to learn how to use periods. Now Armstrong's interesting skill set as both a hardcore twitch reflex hotshot pilot and an ultimate mega engineering nerd got him tapped into 1962 to become the first civilian to join the American astronaut program. With his fat salary of $27,000 a year, Armstrong underwent intense training to prepare him for what he was about to face. In 1966, Neil Armstrong became the first U.S. Uh, civilian in space when he commanded the Gemini 8 mission, a mission that would attempt to first ever spaceship to spaceship docking operation. Now Armstrong masterfully maneuvered the Gemini's capsule alongside some random unmanned rocket in orbit around the Earth, linked the two vessels up, then almost became mildly annoyed when suddenly one of the Gemini's thrusters activated, sending the two linked spaceships into an out of control spiraling series of endless space barrel rolls. Armstrong never won to panic, no matter how insanely uh, the mission is going down in flames, simply flip the switch, undocked with the space jump, turn on his re-entry controls while in space, righted the roll, calmly informed Houston that the mission was 
coming home early and masterfully dropped his tiny capsule from outer space into the Pacific, oh, the Pacific Ocean. All right. You had to really throw something hard at, at Neil Armstrong that would generate any kind of emotional response from him. I don't really remember where I saw this, but my favorite Neil Armstrong story goes like this. One morning, Buzz Aldrin came into the office to get started on work. Neil was sitting at his desk, working on some paperwork, and just looked up for a second to say good morning before going back to his writing. Buzz went to the NASA shift lead to ask what was going on that day, and was told by the NASA techs that the missions were scrapped today because about an hour ago, Neil Armstrong was running a test flight on the lunar landing module when its equipment failed and it plummeted to the Earth and exploded in a giant freaking fireball. Now Neil had almost died, but had somehow managed to eject a mere only 200 feet from the ground and parachute to safety, with only minor injuries. When Buzz protested that he'd uh, just seen Neil two seconds ago, the NASA guy was like, oh yeah, he's just filling out the after mission report. Like it's no big deal that he had just almost died in a giant fiery explosion. Wow. So you can see why he was pretty much the perfect man to be sitting at the controls of the lunar module as it attempted the first ever human descent to the moon in July of 1969. 38 year old Armstrong was selected as mission commander on Apollo 11. Strapped to a ridiculously giant Saturn V rocket and catapulted into space by a massive controlled explosion that propelled him from zero to 243,000 miles an hour in just a couple seconds. Now he spent 10 days in space, landed the lunar module on manual mode, and spent two and a half hours bouncing around on the moon collecting rocks and stuff while one fifth of the world's population walked slack jawed on their TV sets while they were out there. Neil and Buzz Aldrin planted a U.S. flag, a plaque commemorating international peace, and a monument to dead U.S. and Soviet astronauts and cosmonauts. They talked to Richard Nixon on a radio phone and planted a reflector dish in the sea of tranquility that allowed, you know, some nerds back in Austin, Texas to shoot a laser into space and measure the exact distance from the Earth to the moon. Mostly so that people throughout the world would know that this dude traveled 238,900 miles just for science. Alright. Now, Neil and Buzz, they got that limb back off the ground, rejoined the command module, hurtled through the Earth's atmosphere at 35,000 feet per second, and returned home to a massive parade in their honor. Armstrong met the Queen, the Pope, the President, and the Shah of Iran. He received medals of honor from 17 different countries, and also had a couple of airport streets and even a piece of the moon's geography named after him. Fairly certain that he was never going to top that, Neil Armstrong retired from astronauting a year later and uh, bought a farm in Ohio. Now, that was going well, but in 79, he got his wedding ring stuck in the gears of a grain tractor. And Neil Armstrong, of course, was still working a farm, even after he'd done all this stuff, and had the thing rip off his entire finger. But in true Neil freaking Armstrong fashion, he just calmly walked over, picked up the finger, put it on some ice, and drove to the hospital to get it reattached. He went on to work as a professor of aerospace engineering at the University of Cincinnati, was an administrator at NASA, ran his own aerospace tech company, and once sued his barber for selling a lock of his hair on eBay for $3,000. Armstrong told him to either return the hair or donate the $3,000 to charity. The dude donated it. All right. Now, anytime anyone ever asked him about being the first human to set foot on the moon, Neil Armstrong would just say that it was a culmination of over a decade of hard work by over 400,000 people and just leave it at that. He died August 25th, 2012, at the age of 82. Now, like I said at the beginning, this is going to be a kind of a rough one for me because I had a personal connection to this astro badass. When I was in sixth grade, my class made Christmas cards for famous peoples of our choice. Mine, of course, was Neil Armstrong because I was kind of crazy about the whole space thing. I can still rem remember drawing this mouse in a spacesuit in front of a Christmas tree for him. 
thing was huge, about a foot tall. And to my surprise, I got a reply from him. Not a typed PR reply, but a handwritten note and an autographed picture of him in his spacesuit. I was thrilled. And being so young, you know, the whole group of us got a lot of attention over it. Some, a group of us from my class that had received replies from these famous people were in the newspaper. We were on a couple of local radio shows. We thought we were famous. Now, I cut um, and sent Neil Armstrong the newspaper clipping and a nice letter which sparked a short correspondence between us. I soon discovered that what boobs were, of course, and then he was knocked off that pedestal I'd put him on. A few years later, a nice man from our church, though, who worked for McDonnell Douglas and remembered the big, you know, hugabaloo about the whole Neil Armstrong thing, um, he worked for McDonnell Douglas here in St. Louis and took me to go hear uh, Armstrong speak, and I actually got to meet him. Now, I reminded him about the Christmas card. He actually remembered. For a kid who had lost his dad only a few years earlier, having an idol like Neil Armstrong was an important part of my childhood, and I will never forget how nice he was, and of course, how much of a true badass he really was.